Okay, in this section, P.4 factoring part two, we're going to concentrate on working with the trinomials with binomial factors. So you basically have two terms times two terms. And after you distribute everything out um, and you combine your like terms, you will end up with this trinomial. Okay, now there's a few different methods. One of those methods is called trial and error where you basically take factors of this first number and you place them in there. And then you take factors of the back number and you place them in there. And then you foil out all the different options until you get one that gives you the exact middle term that you're supposed to have, okay? That is called trial and error. Um, I don't particularly teach trial and error just because it's not really a method to factoring for me. It's really just a method of like, like what it says, trial and error. Like you're just guessing what the answer could be and then maybe hopefully one of them works, right? Um, I like to know whether or not it's going to factor first of all without doing all of this extra work and then the whole thing is prime and it's not gonna factor, right? Um, it can get a little frustrating if you have like 15 different possibilities and you're trying all of them and none of them work. That's a lot of work for no reason, okay? Or what if there's an, uh, like 60 possibilities? Are we really gonna sit there during a test and try all 60 possibilities, right? Um, it's not likely. So they took it easy on us. They gave us a number with only two sets of factors, one times six and two times three and five, which only has one set of factor, which means you can only have six possibilities, okay? Or four possibilities, I'm sorry. Um, and so that's great and all, but it really does not help me. Um, what if this number had 15, had six possible factors? And what if this number here had, you know, four possible factors. Now I'm going to have like 20 possible answers. Okay. And so trial and method is really not ideal in this um, instance. Okay. But essentially what you would do is you would take these six and one. So notice they put the factor of six and the factor of one and here they did it again. Then they put the factors of two and three and two and three. And then notice they have five in front, one in the back, and then they switched it. And then one in the front, five in the back, and then they switched it just so that I could get every combination. Now, they also put plus signs in between every single term, okay? And that has to do with the signs here, okay? So what I tell people is if you have ax squared plus bx um, plus c, then you know that your factors are going to both have pluses in the middle, okay? If you have AX squared plus BX um, minus C, then you're going to have one with the plus and one with the minus, but the bigger value is gonna be here. Okay. Um, and then if you have AX squared um, minus BX minus C, then that tells me you're gonna have one with the plus and you're gonna have one with the minus, but the larger number is gonna go there. And then finally, if you have AX squared plus BX, but, or no, I'm sorry, minus BX and a minus plus C. Well, if the factors are supposed to multiply to give you a positive, but add to give you a negative, then that means that they're both negative, okay? And so it's just a way to kind of know what the signs are gonna be if you are gonna do that guess and check method, okay? Essentially, if it's a plus sign, they're gonna be the same, right? If it's a plus sign, they're gonna be the same. And then the one in the middle tells you what it's gonna be in the middle. So if that's a plus, they're gonna be the same, but if that's a plus, they're gonna both gonna be plus. Here, the minuses tell you you're gonna have different. One's gonna be plus and one's gonna be minus. But since the middle one is positive, that means the larger number would need to go where the positive is. And since here, the bigger one is negative, that means the larger number is gonna to have to be negative. And I have to be careful because it's really the larger number with the insides give you the larger number. And for here, the outsides will give you the larger number. Okay, so it's very, very tricky. Um, 
So, but instead of learning all of that and memorizing all of that, I have a whole nother method that I like to show people, okay? Um, so they're just showing you that if you would have multiplied all of these, it just so happens that this is the only pair that actually distributes out and combines into the original. And so then that means that this is the factorization of that um, polynomial up there, okay? Um, So they're going to first talk about factors with the leading coefficient is one, which means there's no number in front. Now, when there's no number in front, you can follow this process, and it is very much similar to the same process that I'm going to show you when there is a number in front, but it's just a lot shorter if you work with this one, okay? And so how do they come up with this list of stuff? I don't even do this thing here and then try to guess which one's the answer. What I do is I take, if there's no number in front, what is one times 12? It's just 12, right? And so what I do is I take the 12 and I start trying to figure out all of its um, factors, okay? Now, if you wanna know how far down the list you have to go to guarantee that you have all the factors here, I take the square root of that 12. And so if I do take the square root of 12 and type in a decimal, I get 3.4 something or another. So three is as far down as I'm gonna go on this list, okay? And so how do I figure this out? Well, 12 divided by one is 12. And that's because one times 12 is 12. 12 divided by two is six because two times six is 12. 12 divided by three is four and that's because three times four is 12, okay? And so from this list of factors, you wanna find the factors that add to give you a negative seven result, okay? And so notice that if I'm gonna have to add and get negatives, okay? First of all, we do know that if this number is a positive, then these two numbers are gonna be the same sign. So they're either gonna both be positive or they're gonna both be negative. And since I'm supposed to have a negative result, that tells me that both of these columns should be negative, okay? And so then which of these would add to give me negative seven? Negative one plus a negative 12 is negative 13. So that's not the pair. Negative two plus negative six is negative eight. So that's not the pair we're looking for. Negative three plus negative four does equal negative seven. So this is the pair that we are looking for, okay? And since the number in the front is a one, we automatically know that there's gonna be a one and a one in the front. And so you can literally just write X negative three or X minus three, and then X negative four or X minus four, okay? And then you have this factorization already, okay? So this will be the process that I use to factor um, problems that have a one in the front, okay? So it says sometimes polynomials with more than three terms can be factored by grouping, okay? Um, and so we'll talk about what grouping is. Essentially what grouping is, is you're cutting the problem in half Remember that that minus is the sign of this 3x, okay? So when I chop it off, I can't chop it off here because that sign goes with this number. You have to chop it off in front of that minus. And then essentially what you're doing is you're asking yourself, what do these two guys have in common? They have an x squared in common. And so if I factor that x squared out, x squared times x is x cubed, and x squared times a 2 is 2x squared. Then over here on the other side, whatever symbol is here must come down. If it's a plus, it must come down. Then what do these two guys have in common? They have a three in common. But notice that it's a negative three that you're factoring out. So a negative three times a positive x gives me negative three x, and a negative three times a negative two gives me a positive six. And then you notice that I have the same thing that they do, right? It's just I have a bar in the middle. 
you'll notice that this left side and the right side both have this x minus 2 in common. So if I took the x minus 2 out, I would only have x squared. And if I took that x minus 2 out, all I would have is the x minus or the minus 3. OK, and this is not a perfect square, so I can't use my difference of uh, squares formula here. It's just going to stay like this. This is the final factorization. OK. Um, so for factoring by grouping, the first thing you want to do is factor um, anything any common factors using the distributive property, um, then factor according to one of the special formulas, and then you factor this according to this. Um, there's really two different things here. I'm gonna go over this process. I have not gone over that process. The only one I've gone over is this one. We have not addressed what happens when there's a number in front. It's a whole process, okay? But this is how you would do it. The first step is to always factor out a common factor throughout the whole polynomial if you can, okay? Then if you have two terms, you'll see if you can factor according to one of the special polynomial forms. If you have three terms, then you'll factor using the method we learned for this one or the method we're going to learn for this one when there's a number in front. And then if there's four terms, then you factor it by grouping, okay? Um, we just haven't gone over both of the processes for three terms. We've only gone over the process when there's no number in front. It's like an invisible one, okay? But when there's a number in front that's not one, it's a little bit different, okay? Similar, but different. So um, they actually are gonna just gloss right over it. So I am gonna have to address it. So give me one second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you that method on how to factor problems when there is a number in front. And it doesn't matter how small or how large this number is in the front, you will get the answer, okay? So the, it's called the AC method is what it's called. And you'll notice that when I was doing the problem that had a one in the front, I did something that you're gonna have to do all the time. Notice when we did this problem, I took that one and I multiplied it by 12, and that's the number that I started factoring out, okay? That's why it's called the AC method, because normally it's AX squared plus BX plus C. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking the A times the C, and that's why it's called the AC method. And so when I take 12 times 15, actually 12 times negative 15, 12 times negative 15 is a negative 180, okay? And so I've got to factor out this negative 180. What is the square root of 180? Don't put a negative because you won't be able to do the square root of a negative. But I do get 13 point something, okay? So that means I'm going to go down this list all the way to 13. And as tedious as that may be, it's a whole lot less tedious than trying to get all the factors of this, all the factors of that, all the combinations of the two, and then guess and check every single entry, okay? So 180 divided by one is 180. 180 divided by two is 90. 180 divided by three is 60. 180 divided by four 
is 45. 180 divided by five is 36. 180 divided by six is 30. 180 divided by seven is a decimal. So this is not going to be a pair. 180 divided by eight is another decimal. So this is not going to work. 180 divided by nine is 20. 180 divided by 10 is 18. 180 divided by 11 is a decimal. 180 divided by 12 is 15. And 180 divided by 13 is a decimal. So already we outruled about four of those options, right? Um, another thing that we have to consider is if I'm going to end up with a negative 180, that means one of these numbers does need to be a negative. But how do I know whether it's going to be the smaller numbers or the larger numbers? Okay, that you tell by the middle sign. Remember, I'm supposed to combine these, add these together and get a positive 11. Well, when I'm adding, in order for me to end up with a positive, it means the bigger number would have had to have been positive. So this right here will tell me the sign of the bigger column. So that means that these are all gonna be positive. So in order for me to multiply to get a negative 180, that would mean that all the smaller numbers would need to be negative. So you do have to think about those signs for just a moment before starting to figure out the results. And so this is super ridiculous because there's no way that's gonna give me 11, right? That gives me 179, it's way too big. I think I'm gonna start from the bottom going up because I think I will get numbers closer to the 11. So negative 12 plus 15 is actually positive three, that doesn't work. This gives me eight, that doesn't work, but we're getting closer, right? nine plus a positive 20 is 11. So this is the pair that works. Okay. Now remember, when there's no number in front, I would simply say that the answer is x minus nine and x plus 20. But if I were to foil this out, I will not ever get this 12 in the front. I will just get x squared and that's it. So this is definitely not the way to go once you get those factors. You can go straight to the answer when there's no number in front. But when there is a number in front, it's a whole nother process, okay? And we had to talk about grouping first before we can talk about this next process. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take these three terms and turn them into four terms using this breakdown, okay? I know that I can get positive 11x by combining a negative 9x and a positive 20x using these numbers, right? So if I were to combine those, I would get positive 11x. And then just bring down constant and bring down that first term, 12x squared. And now that you've turned it into a four-term problem, you must use grouping in order to factor a four-term problem. So I'm going to chop it off here because that plus sign belongs to the 20. And these two both have an X in common, and they can both be divided by 3. So then 3X times 4X gives me 12X squared, and 3X times 3 gives me 9X. Whatever this symbol is, I must bring it down. These two don't have an X in common, but they both can be divided by 5. So it's a positive five that I am using. So positive time five times a positive four X will give me positive 20 X and a positive five times a negative three will give me a negative 15. So then the left side and the right side both have this four X minus three in common. And so if I took that out, all I'd be left with is three X and the plus five. And then this is the actual factorization. And if you wanted to check it, you could FOIL it all out. So 4x times 3x is 12x squared. 4x times 5 is 20x. Negative 3 times 3x is negative 9x. And negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. And I do get the original polynomial or trinomial. 
so it does work out, okay? So super, super important that you understand that process. It is lengthy, but I promise you that the bigger that this number gets and the bigger that that number gets and the bigger this gets as a result, the harder it is to do it during that trial and error process, okay? So I don't like to waste too much time on going into too far depth with that um, process. I like to show a process that works no matter what. Now, here's the big question. Sometimes you can get problems that are prime. So remember I mentioned if you're doing the trial and error, if you have 60 different possibilities, um, here I had what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different possibilities. And you would have had to foil out all nine of them to see which one was gonna give it to you, okay? Instead of foiling out all nine of those possibilities and then finding out that none of them worked, um, if you go through all of these factors and none of them add to give you that middle term, that's how you know it cannot be factored. You took the square root, you know that the list only goes down to 13 and none of these worked, then you know it's prime. You don't have to sit there and multiply out nine different pairs that you had to think to put together in the first place. And then just to come out that you wasted all that time because it was prime, okay? So that's the method that I like to show when I'm doing these problems. So we're going to go through this now. Look at this problem. It does have, um, it does tell me exactly what it wants me to do. It just wants me to factor out the common factor. So I do notice that all three of these guys have a Z. So I am going to factor out that Z. And then when I do factor that Z out, oh, I also notice that all of them have a factor of two. So I can factor out two Z. So then two Z times a Z squared will give me a two Z cubed. And I have a minus sign. So two times two will give me a four, but I need Z times a Z to give me a Z squared. I have a plus sign. Two times three will give me six. And I already have the Z, so I don't need any more variables. Okay, and that's all they asked me to do on the first one. Now, the second one also says factor out the common factor. Now, I can obviously see that x minus 5 is a common factor, but if you notice, 3 and 6 also have a common factor of 3. So when I factor that 3 out, the only thing I'm really missing here is the x. Okay, and then I'm going to put my plus sign. This came out but three times what will give me six? Three times two will give me six. And so then I've successfully factor out the common factor. Now here it says factor the difference of two squares. So first thing you need to do is these are not two squares, first of all. So that should be a clue that there's a common factor that needs to be done first. So always take out your greatest common factor first, okay? And so between these two, they don't have any variables, any x's in common, but I can divide them both by seven. And so 63 divided by seven is nine, 28 divided by seven is four. And so when I multiply that in, I do get these values, so I have done that correctly. And then I know that nine is three squared, and I know that four x squared is two x squared. So the seven will go here. And then according to that difference of two squares formulas, I have a three here and a three here because the nine is in the front and a two X and a two X here because the four X squared is in the back. One will have a plus and one will have the minus. It doesn't matter if you put the minus here and the plus there or vice versa like I have, you'll still get the same answer. Okay, um, this doesn't have any more powers, neither does this one. So this is factored completely, which is what the directions asked us to do. So we first factored out the GCF, then we factored using the difference of two squares. So here it wants me to factor out again, 
Um, but here I don't have a GCF. It doesn't have any U's in common and you never factor out a one because it doesn't do anything if you factor out a one, nothing changes. So I just need to figure out what is being squared here. I'm not sure. 2401 U to the fourth equals something squared. I can guess for the U. I know that U squared squared will give me U to the fourth, but what about 2401? Let me take the square root of 2401. Ah, 49. So apparently 49 times 49 equals 2401, okay? So I did figure out what was being squared there. And then one, of course, is always just one squared. So I'm gonna set up the two parentheses. I'm 49 u squared in the front to get me this number in the front, the ones in the back, one should have a plus and one of them should have a minus. Okay, let's see, number five. Ah, so this one does not have a number in front. So if it doesn't have a number in front, that means they're ones. And remember I told you, you can't factor out ones. This doesn't have an X, so you can't factor out Xs. So there's no GCF in this one. So I'm gonna go straight to that method that we were using. Well, one times negative 72 is just negative 72. What is the square root of 72? I don't know. Square root of 72. I'm gonna hit the double arrow to get a decimal and it's eight point something. So I'm gonna go down this list all the way until I get to eight. Then I'm gonna do 72 divided by one, 72 divided by two, 72 divided by three, I think it's 14. Nope, I was wrong, 24. 72 divided by four. 72 divided by five is a decimal, so this one doesn't work. 72 divided by six. 72 divided by seven, another decimal. 72 divided by eight, and I get nine. Now, what's supposed to happen? We need to look at this. I am gonna have one of these columns is gonna be negative and the other one positive, so that when I multiply, I end up with a negative, but the bigger number needs to be a negative. So that means these are going to be negative and the ones in the front will be positive. And so then let's do those computations to see which one will give us a negative one, okay? And I see it already at the bottom because eight plus negative nine does equal negative one. So this is the pair that I'm gonna need, okay? And because there's no number in front, I can just say X and a positive eight and X and a negative nine and I'm done.